My name is John Morvick. I'm from Minneapolis in the United States, and I'm an education futurist. So I'm really looking at the future of work and what it means for us in schools and what we need to be doing today. And you also wrote uh, the book A Nomad Society? Right, so I wrote a book uh, a couple years ago. I authored or edited the book uh, called Nomad Society. So we had nine authors from, from several continents come together and collaborate on looking at the future of work uh, and uh, what it means for us in schools, but also businesses and connecting some best practices and looking some uh, models out there as well. Um, nomads are nomads are knowledge workers that can work anytime, anywhere, with just about anybody. Uh, it used to be that our work and place was one and the same, that, that we showed up every day and stamped the, uh, the same documents, uh, at a government office every day, or we press the same button at a factory every day. Uh, but that's really changing. We're moving from job to job within organizations as well as outside of organizations. Sometimes changing all these, uh, these careers. Um, and what it means for us, though, is that we're much more valued for the individual knowledge that we have, what, you know, what's inside of our heads. Because uh, the knowledge you have is different from my knowledge. And the challenge for us is what new value can we create uh, as we move nomadically throughout organizations and jobs and gigs. So that's what I like to call it nomad, K-N-O-W-M-A-D, because it's really about knowledge nomadism. And about the writing process, did you also practice what you preach and also use the principles in your own process? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I practice what I preach. Um, I'm a total nomad, uh, working independently now. So I had a, uh, a nice job at the University of Minnesota. Uh, but you do have to practice what you preach. Uh, so I, I work in co-working spaces. Uh, my, my office is on my iPad and my laptop. Um, and, and really connect in different ways and working hard to add value. And um, I also see that uh, uh, the nomads, they are really adapting really fast also to, ne to, to new techniques. But the corporates, they got quite some uh, challenges uh, about connecting to the nomads. Uh, what challenges do you see? And what is happening that it's it, it is, it is getting, getting better? Right, so nomads aren't necessarily independent of corporations. So you can have nomads within corporations. You know, you have entrepreneurs on the outside and intrapreneurs on the inside. And also people that are really good at networking and connecting and creating value within organizations, even if it's really hard to tell. Uh, so what a person does within an organization and create value could be completely different than what's in the job description. And that's a very big shift. Some corporations get it, some don't. Um, others are tapping into uh, the potential of their employees to uh, uh, act more nomadically. Uh, there's a health services company in the Netherlands that fired all the managers, got rid of human resources, and let their employees uh, self-organize and, uh, and network nomadically and find ways to create value and communicate it and wound up saving the company a whole lot of money. And uh, so then also people are more judged about, not about uh, their attendance, but uh, at the things they're producing, so in, in their added value. Do you also see that, that, that that's, uh, we're talking about the HR departments, about uh, your salary? Do you also see changes that organizations are uh, giving more uh, reward or salary to people that really add value and make it more clear about that? I don't think so. I think, that, I think there's some friction. I think that they're starting to wake up to it. The, the problem is, is that Rather than looking at employees as, as real assets, as value creating assets and trusting them to you know, produce great things for the company, um, many companies just view employees as human resources and that we're kind of like cogs in a machine that could be interchanged and replaced. And the truth is, you know, the modern workplace, that, I mean, that the reality of the world is that that can't exist anymore. We can't operate companies uh, or knowledge producing companies, information based companies, um, like we operate factories. We just can't do that. We can't swap humans uh, like uh, machine parts. So they're slowly figuring that out. Um, and the, there's a, you know, the companies are fighting to keep the best, um, to keep the best talent. But, um, you know, and the talent kind of gets bored, they want to move on and do something else, then people move on nomadically. And why do you think that companies really want to have the talent uh, as their employees? Uh, why are they not just hiring them by using platforms or individual uh, professionals? You know, some, some companies are. Um, some think that they can save money or don't have to worry about uh, 
don't have to worry about uh, long-term employment issues by hiring uh, contract employees. And so contract work is really growing. In the United States right now, it's about 35% of the workforce. By 2020, we project it's going to be about uh, 45%. So it's a growing trend. A lot of people are becoming nomads by choice. Others are being uh, really forced into that role as well. It's a huge and growing segment of the workforce. And how do you prevent that it's, uh, that it's not only because of cost effectiveness, but uh, about really getting more value out of your people? Because I see quite some, some uh, like in Netherlands, it's, it's quite expensive to have your personnel. So like yeah. what, like when, it, when it gets sick, you have to pay them for two more years. So how uh, are you going to prevent that the whole nomads uh, philosophy isn't just a cost effective philosophy, but also will make better companies and better ah, workers? Yeah, you know, we need get governments to wake up a bit. Uh, that we need new social contracts because it used to be that uh, you know you do everything as you're told in school uh, you get a college degree you get a job in a company you start off low you progress you progress progress gosh maybe become the CEO you retire and everything's happy but that doesn't exist anymore now you're lucky to get a job when you finish college and you're very lucky if you survive five years there um, because people are moving in and out and for governments and for societies and for communities, we need to think of new ways to support each other. And like, like how? Um, there's all sorts of interesting conversations. I like um, in Germany and Canada, Singapore and elsewhere, I mean, there's some conversations about having basic income. So for those times when we are not employed, um, it could be you know, something that, that helps, but that requires a little bit, you know, a different social contract. Uh, the Dutch government, uh, the social affairs minister, uh, was talking about we need to be prepared for a jobless future. So we really need to reframe what a job is uh, and what, the, what that means for us. You know, what if we have a future you know, within 10 years where only 25% of us have jobs? I mean, jobs. You know, that's a big difference. And yeah. we, have to, we have to start preparing for that possibility. And today we are at the Seeds to Meet Global Conference. Uh, so why are we here? Uh, what attraction to Seeds to Meet? I like the, the seats to be concept because, well, co-working is very, it's very attractive for nomads, um, but I like the seats to meet model uh, a bit more because it's not selling desks in the traditional office, rather it's selling, you know, you have a seat, uh, you can meet with other people, um, but it's, it's a very friendly space for nomads and also provides a technology um, uh, backbone to help support it. I mean, everything's still kind of in beta and continuous development, but it's really focusing on the human side, the value side. So for me, you know, running my own business, I, which I can run out of a seats to meet, uh, you know, you check in, you, you say, you know, I'll say, hello, my name is John, my talents are this, and my interests are this, and I'm working on this, and you're doing the same. And if I need help on something, say web development, I, I know where to, where to find uh, that sort of talent because there's a take cloud of, um, of talents and skills and interests that are available there. And so there's a real opportunity to, to create things that are bigger than any of us could do on our own. Say if I was just working on my home, or uh, we're out of a, you know, a traditional uh, co-working space. So I really, I really like this model a lot. And um, what do you think that traditional organizations can learn from organizations like Seeds to Meet? I think what organizations can learn from, from places like Seeds to Meet is that this model is built on trusting the crowd a bit more to provide value and encouraging people to create value for each other. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we need money, we need to eat, um, and they, they do okay job, you know, uh, making money, but uh, there's also all these uh, intangibles that, that they bring in and what the community contributes back into Seats to Meet as a business, but also amongst themselves. So I think that putting a lot of trust into the development of these intangibles and new value creation is something that, that a lot of companies elsewhere should really pay attention to.